it's a paradoxical time uh, for Jews in America. On the one hand, we're probably the most accepted, respected, and successful diaspora Jewish community in the history of the world. On the other hand, it's a time of real potential vulnerability as Jews continue to be a smaller and smaller percentage of the overall US population. Power dynamics are rapidly shifting and anti-Semitism is on the rise from both the political left and right. The murders at the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh, the Chabad shooting in Poway, both on the heels of the Charlottesville rally and the chance Jews will not replace us was a wake up call for many of us. Here in New York, we're dealing with ever growing numbers of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic attacks. Uh, we wake up to weekly, if not daily, news of Jews being attacked in Brooklyn and swastik is being painted on Jewish buildings. So I don't think anyone can really debate that the growing tide of hatred and anti-Semitism in America deserves our focused attention and coordinated communal action. I'm increasingly concerned, though, that anti-Semitism is being used by those on both the political left and right to attack and demonize the other. As Deborah Lipstadt said after the Poway shooting, anti-Semitism does not come from one direction, it's on the left and on the right. If you only see it in the opposite side of where you stand politically, then you are blind in at least one eye and turning the fight against it into a political weapon. All forms of anti-Semitism are pernicious and all must be combated and weaponizing anti-Semitism for political gain severely hinders our collective ability to address the challenge. On the physical security front, UJ has worked for many years, primarily through the JCRC, in helping secure Jewish institutions in our local community. On the federal level, SCAN, the Secure Community Network, a joint venture of the Conference of Presidents and the Jewish Federations of North America, has been developing a coordinated national Jewish response, security response for Jewish institutions. But it's clear that much more needs to be done both on the local and federal levels to enhance the security of our Jewish institutions, and that's a significant priority for UJ today. We're also now focused on proactive strategies, those that can potentially reverse the current trends by increasing our funding to Jewish organizations in the community relations arena across the spectrum, and also by working with other faith-based communities who can be allies when it matters. Bottom line, the current moment demands courageous action, and it's vital we do all we can, as best as we can, together across this spectrum to address this challenge. Again, I'm very grateful to Arthur and Malcolm and the Conference of Presidents for convening us, and I look forward to learning with all of you today. Thanks so much. There is a serious challenge, or I should say a complex of challenges, that are characterized by Jew hatred, discrimination against Jews, and crimes against Jews. It is indeed a global challenge, but America has proven it is not immune to this cancer that metastasizes in societies everywhere. Democracy is an antidote, but it is not a preventative. Education is essential to countering it, but the purveyors of hate find safe haven behind the ivory tower. You all know the statistics and you understand or sense the current challenges and the potential for their expansion in all sectors, business, government, politics, elementary and college education, entertainment, culture, religion, and media. All of them are potentially breeding grounds for the expansion of the Jew hatred. No longer characterized by isolated incidents or threats, the challenges of anti-Semitism today is a multifaceted global one that requires a thoughtful, unified, uncompromised response involving all aspects of society. We need to build coalitions and allies everywhere and anywhere. It is an attack on fundamental values and the underpinnings of our society. And in particular, and while bigotry and racism raise their ugly heads, we see the war against the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, the Jewish faith, and Jewish history as primary. Your presence, and as was noted in more than two times the number we had planned, more than 58 organizations are represented here today, indicates that you get it, that you understand the nature of this immediate challenge. 
And we had no public announcements at all. So everyone here came because they heard, because they care, and they want to be part of the solution. And we are looking for you to share your thoughts, your ideas, and your needs. It is a time like this when it is truly essential that we come together recognizing that what we have in common far outweighs our differences. We need each other to succeed. No Republicans or Democrats, no liberal or conservative, no blue or red. We all, we all need each other and we can each hold our own beliefs and visions no matter what and stick to our principles. But we also rise above personal perspectives for none of us can do it alone, not locally, nationally or internationally. We have to think cooperatively and creatively. Think of the communities, the children, the future children who are watching us and asking, did we learn the lessons from the past? No more memorials for dead Jews. No more our being the canary in the mine. That must be things of the past. Our goal in this forum is to foster agreement. We must expose and root out the insiders, the abettors, the supporters, the defenders, the purveyors, let alone those who engage in physical assaults on people, institutions, or property. Every incident has to be reported and recorded at the very least. And there couldn't have been more appropriate Parsha than the one we just read, we are going to read this Shabbos, where we read that God and Ruvain decided to stay on the other side of the Jordan and let the rest of the tribes go and fight for the liberation of the Jewish homeland. And Moses said to him, Achichem holchim lamilchama v'atem teshvu po, your brothers are going to go to war and you think you can sit here? You think you will be immune from the results? You think you will not be affected, that you can somehow have your nirvana here and the rest of the people will have to fight for their existence alone? And they, of course, ultimately joined. And the lesson is clear to all of us that none of us can stand and be bystanders, that what happens to one part of the Jewish people affects all parts of the Jewish people, and that all of us have to come together as a Jewish community, as a community of organizations, a community of individuals, each with our own per perspectives, but recognizing the overall goal. We have a three-phase plan, and it comes out of the experience of Pittsburgh and other incidents which ended the age of deniability for American Jews. We can't say we don't know or we didn't know. It's the end of the age of innocence and we will be held to account. So this is the first, actually the second part of the first phase, because we held a consultation on BDS several months ago. But with this, we will collate and distill all the suggestions, comments, and recommendations of existing or planned programs into a summary document, which we will circulate, and then discuss the follow-up and the implementation. From physical security to legal measures to legislation, to social media, and on. We will address all of these subjects in this phase as it affects the United States. The next phase will be a national assembly in Washington late this year or early next year. We have received really strong support from the leaders of Congress on both sides of the aisle, from the administration, from societal leaders across the board, religious, political leaders. And I will detail this all later, but it, would be a, uh, it will not be specifically a Jewish event. We want non-Jews to lead the war against Jew hatred. We are not the perpetrators, we are the victims. Others must condemn, they must stand up, they must speak out, and they have to draw the red lines and see to it that they are implemented. And the third phase of this effort will be in the fall of 2020, which will be a world gathering, probably in Europe, with world leaders participating, but not with the standard political expediency. We want action programs that go to the root causes, the inciters, the enablers, the supporters, and the perpetrators. This is modeled on the experience of those who remember in the 70s, the World Conferences on Soviet Jewry, which galvanized world public opinion and mobilized support for the fight for the freedom of Soviet Jews. It's time that we build a movement, not another organization, one in which everyone will have a stake. So today, it is important that we recognize that we are building the foundation for this global movement. It will belong to all of you, and we come together to come forward, to speak out, to say that Jew hatred stops now. No exceptions, no excuses, that many will follow us, but we have to be there first, to maximize our resources, to extend our outreach, and to be there for each other. 
Ultimately, this will and must be a mobilization of all people of goodwill and courage and a powerful movement that will isolate the purveyors of hate, of Jew hatred, of racism and bigotry, and honor those who stand against it. And anti-Zionism is an expression of anti-Semitism and relevant to these discussions. So now we will hear from a number of people this morning, and we wish you very fruitful deliberations. If anyone wants an example of the enduring importance and relevance and power of the Conference of Presidents, one needs only look to a forum like this and the plans that are underway for what's coming soon in the next year to address one of the most urgent challenges facing our people today. And so I want to thank you for your leadership and everything you're doing, and of course, all the member organizations for, uh, for making this happen. Eric, thank you for your hospitality and uh, for your incredible leadership here in New York. Uh, not an unimportant community in the Jewish people, and, uh, and we appreciate it very much. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, in Ken Marcus, uh, who is about to speak, um, when you talk about people who can bring real force to bear on this issue, we have the Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights, and he is fantastic. And I want to tell you that a short time ago, he and I participated in a meeting at the White House that brought to bear people from state and treasury and education and justice to discuss how to bring the full force of the administration to bear on this urgent crisis. And then one week later, a few days later, at the Department of Justice, there was a forum on anti-Semitism at which the Attorney General, the Secretary of Education, and the Secretary of Treasury were represented and spoke. Now, I will tell you that to have three cabinet officers come together in a forum and state in the clearest terms their commitment to combating this ancient sickness and rooting it out of our country is a gift. It's a gift that we have to acknowledge. Because one of the great assets we have in this fight is the unvarnished and unquestionable commitment of the United States to protecting the Jewish people throughout the world, to fighting anti-Semitism, and to supporting the State of Israel. But I want to talk about another asset as well. And another asset in this fight, in the midst of all of the problems we have and all of the challenges we have, we all know, it was said, you know, rising anti-Semitism in Europe, Jews getting attacked on the streets, Pittsburgh and Poway here, the college campuses are a disaster in many cases in the United States. Uh, the you know, social media is boiling over with Jew hatred. But, but it is important to remember that we have incredible opportunities right now. One of those opportunities is the commitment of leaders throughout the world to stand with us and fight with us to end what they understand is a threat not only to the Jewish people, but to their own societies and their own countries. You know, my job is to be America's senior diplomat on this issue. I've already made, I don't know, four or five trips overseas, uh, nine countries, I think, and I've met with leaders at all levels, prime ministers, ministers, parliamentarians, all the way to local mayors and coordinators. And it is astounding the degree to which leaders, talking about non-Jews, understand that this is the crisis of our time. And these are people who stand up with power and eloquence and they say, this is not only about the Jews. By the way, I'll add if it were, that would be reason enough to do it. That would be reason enough to, spe to spare no effort to combat the persecution of the most persecuted minority in world history. But they understand it's not only about the Jews. They say that, that this is about our countries, our continent, our society. What kind of country do we want? And so they understand that anti-Semitism is human history's greatest barometer of suffering. President Trump calls it a vile poison every time he speaks about it, and it is a vile poison because every society that has imbibed it has rotted to its core. 
And that's the danger we face in America as well. And so make no mistake, the stakes in this fight could not possibly be higher. And it's not only about us. It is truly about Malcolm, as you said, our children and our grandchildren who look to us, who look to us with trust that we will protect them and take care of them. And so the question is, what kind of world will we bequeath to them? That's what's at stake here. Now, we can always say, we wish, we were, we wish there were more of such people. But I'm here to tell you there are enough. There are plenty. And my job is not only to pummel the anti-Semites and pressure the recalcitrant. It is also to support with the full weight of the United States those friends and allies around the world who get it and are fighting this fight with us. And there are many. If there weren't, I might be pessimistic. I'm not. If I were pessimistic, I wouldn't have taken this job. I actually believe we can not only contain this, but roll this back. But in saying that we've got these friends and allies, that is not an invitation to complacency. That means that now is the time, not tomorrow, not next week, now is the time for us to marshal all of our resources and make sure that we capitalize on the opportunities we have today when everyone appreciates the urgency of it and when everybody is appalled by what's happening. Now is the time. And that's why this forum today is so important. I have no doubt that if we, if we bring to realization the motto of the Conference of Presidents, right, strength through unity, uh, we will change the world. You know, Jewish unity is a very powerful thing. I want to just give you one quick example. When the British Labour Party became a place where anti-Semitism was welcomed, the Jewish community in the United Kingdom stood together. They put aside all political differences, and there are many over there. They put aside all political differences, and they stood united. In fact, that was the banner headline, United We Stand, of all the of three competing newspapers. And then they held a rally that was entitled Enough is Enough. An inspiration, by the way. Enough is enough. When the Jewish people stood together, look what happened. There's a civil war going on in the British Labour Party today. And I've worked with leaders in the Labour Party, and I still today just spoke to one, in the Labour Party, who are fighting this with every effort they can muster. That's the power of Jewish unity. And if we take this seriously, our responsibilities our membership in the conference for those of us who are members, our commitment to leading the Jewish people, that has to be our marching order. Jewish unity, not on other issues, but on this issue, on the issue of our survival and our future and the safety of our children, you bet. Ish echad belev echad, as the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai, nothing less than that is required at this time. If we do that, we will win this great battle and look upon ourselves and our work in this era with enormous pride that we made a difference for our children and changed the world. Thank you so much. I think that uh, a point that both uh, Malcolm and uh, Elon uh, Carr made uh, resonates with me, and that is uh, the importance of having spaces like this where we come from different perspectives. Uh, but we stand together. And I know that there is uh, a diverse uh, range of opinion uh, here in this room. Uh, and the reason that I am so pleased uh, that this uh, convening is happening and, and that I can be a part of it uh, is that it is, I believe, crucial uh, that we put aside the differences that we have on so many topics when we address uh, bigotry and in particular when we address anti-Semitism. And this opportunity to stand together uh, in what uh, I am pleased to hear will be a, a global uh, battle um, uh, is, uh, is an important one. Um, I want to highlight something that uh, Special Envoy uh, Carr uh, indicated, which is that there is right now a tremendous energy uh, in Washington and in the administration, as well as 
uh, throughout the Jewish community to fight against anti-Semitism. And I want to say that that's something that can't be taken for granted because it hasn't existed at all time. And it's something that we need to uh, continue. Uh, that we need to continue to um, focus on uh, because there are everywhere, even today, those who would deny or to minimize uh, the extent of this problem. Uh, and so it is important that we stand together in part uh, to make sure that this issue remains at the forefront of public attention as it has been in the last uh, several weeks, but as it needs to be, as it needs to be so that we have not only uh, convenings but also uh, action. Was that to speak um, about the definition of anti-Semitism? Uh, now, I wrote a book about that, so when I was asked to speak with five, I assumed that meant uh, five years, um, and was disappointed uh, to learn I'm, I only have five hours, but that's okay. Um, so two things about the definition of anti-Semitism. The first thing is, uh, far, as far as I'm concerned, we define anti-Semitism not just so that we can tell in particular uh, instances this or that was anti-Semitic. He or she is an anti-Semite. The reason that we have established definitions of anti-Semitism like the IRA definition is so that we can change the culture, so that we can change the culture in colleges and universities, so that we can change the culture in world bodies, so that there is an understanding that uh, anti-Semitic incidents need to be addressed as forcefully as any other form of bigotry, whether or not they relate uh, to Israel. And so when we use, as uh, the Department of Education recently indicated we will use in appropriate instances the IHRA definition. Um, yes, it is important uh, what that definition is and how it relates to Natan Sharansky's uh, so-called 3D test. But the bigger point, the bigger point is how vital it is that we consistently emphasize the need to treat anti-Semitism not as a, a special interest issue and not just as an aspect of Hasbara or uh, Israeli uh, politics, but as an indispensable effort of anyone who is serious about dealing with uh, discrimination and bigotry in America or uh, in, the, in the world. Um, I'm um, honored to be with uh, uh, Special Envoy uh, Carr, uh, who's doing great work in the area of fighting uh, anti-Semitism around the world. And we need to have positions like uh, his and work that, of that sort. Now, I don't focus exclusively on anti-Semitism uh, anymore. At the Office for Civil Rights, my charge is to address discrimination and harassment against students based on race, color, national origin, sex, age, disability, a wide range uh, of issues. And we have so many battles that we need to fight, and I'm so glad that so many in this room are engaged daily, not just in the fight against anti-Semitism, but in the fight for justice uh, for all people. When I look at anti-Semitism as a part of the broader agenda that I'm working on, and every day I deal with issues ranging from sexual harassment to uh, anti-black and anti-Hispanic uh, discrimination and racially uh, uh, motivated uh, discipline and, and so on and so forth, to me the issue is not just the number of incidents that we have on a college campus, although the growing numbers are alarming and should be alarming to us, uh, but unfortunately, the trajectory, the fact that things are no longer getting worse and, and uh, no longer getting better and, in fact, are getting, getting worse. And that is why we need uh, to make a concerted effort, not just to identify particular incidents, not just to resolve particular conflicts, but to change the culture again so that there is a broader understanding and so that all students receive the same justice. Second, I want to say just a brief word from where I sit about what the problem is on anti-Semitism. I know that we will have... Uh, some experts talking about the college campus in just a little bit. People ask me sometimes uh, for my thoughts on where we have the problem on college campuses. <clears throat> Five years ago, I would have said BDS is the number one issue, and maybe it still is. But I would say that right now, to me, there are three intertwined uh, issues that stand together. First is BDS. There was a reference to a uh, conference recently at the Department of Justice at which Secretary Betsy DeVos spoke. She addressed the meaning of BDS. Do people know what BDS stands for? She explained it well. She said, and I quote, BDS stands for anti-Semitism. I think that's important to remember first and foremost. And we still see it at college campuses and elsewhere around America. The second thing we're seeing increasingly is anti-normalization, which is sometimes connected with BDS, but sometimes it's uh, also separate. We had one case in Massachusetts recently in which uh, a, uh, a Jewish pro-Israel group was denied, uh, at least for a period of time, the recognition that had been given to other groups. This wasn't, strictly speaking, a BDS, but it was an effort to deny to the Jewish people, individually and collectively, the same normalcy 
for other groups, and we've seen where that leads. And then the third thing we see is the denial of free speech as a tactic, which is to say censorship or uh, disinvitations or preventing either Jewish or pro-Israel speakers from uh, making their, their message known. We see those three things, the effort to boycott, the effort to silence, and the effort to uh, delegitimize. Some people say that with BDS, the issue isn't so much whether Israel's actually boycotted and loses money, but rather whether the state of Israel loses legitimacy in world opinion. And I'm going to say that's not right. I'm sorry, that's not wrong. It's not wrong that that's a significant part of uh, BDS. But what I will say is this. If you think that the main danger of BDS is that Israel will lose delegitimization, it will lose legitimization and will be threatened, you're not paying attention. The real problem is that you and I and our children will, because the real target is not just one country. It is the Jewish people as a whole. And I will say that it's even beyond that. I will say that the effort to silence, the effort to boycott, the effort to delegitimize is part of a broader effort to undermine really the protections and the bulwarks of the uh, Jewish people in America and the United States. And we fight against that because it is not just about Israel, it is because it is about all of us, and because if we were to lose that battle, it isn't even just about the Jews. It is about the protections that everyone needs. So in fighting against BDS, in fighting against anti-normalization, in fighting against censorship, we're not just supporting the state of Israel or any other state. It is, in a sense, a life and death battle for the Jewish people and for us all. Thank you. This past Saturday marked nine months since the attack in Pittsburgh. Today, the building that housed Tree of Life Synagogue and two other congregations sits empty, a place that should be filled with life and brimming with people, silent. As we work to address anti-Semitism, we must acknowledge a stark reality. Our houses of worship are being targeted, our community institutions attacked, and our very culture and identity threatened. From Pittsburgh to Poway, this is the reality to being Jewish in the United States. We will not choose the time and place of the next event. We can choose to be more prepared, more resilient, and more empowered, and we must. I'd like to thank Malcolm and Arthur for the invitation, Eric for hosting. At the Secure Community Network, our mission is to ensure the safety and security of the Jewish people across North America. The goal is not merely to ensure the security of our facilities, though, not merely to preserve life, it's to grow it, to ensure that our Jewish organizations remain vital parts of our common society, as we just heard, and with them, we grow our values, traditions, and culture for our children, grandchildren, and those yet to come. Right now, we face the most dynamic and complex threat environment in this country and directed against our community than at any point in the country's history, according to our partners at the FBI. 850 open domestic terrorism investigations, 58% of all religiously motivated hate crimes directed against our community. As the research from the Center on Extremism from ADL shows us, a resurgent, increasingly violent white supremacist movement, and we average one mass attack every two weeks in this country. Since the attack in Pittsburgh, our law enforcement partners have arrested individuals planning attacks on synagogues in Washington State, Ohio, Georgia, California. Just over the last several days, we were working with the FBI on an individual threatening a synagogue in Wyoming. Are we ready? From a security perspective, we can be. Over 22 months, the security director in Pittsburgh, who SCN helped hire, <coughs> conducted 45 threat assessments and 136 trainings, reaching 5,600 members of the community. The last training he did at Tree of Life was just eight weeks before the attack. He had conducted threat assessments there as well. The preparation and work that went into the safety and security of the Pittsburgh community, led by the Federation there and supported by SCN, minimized injury and helped save lives. We have to replicate the same level of safety and security preparedness across our whole community. It has to be coordinated, comprehensive, and professionalized. We train people to commit to action. Will we, as leaders, do the same? Every day, we're working with our over 450 communities and our 50 security directors to do just that. We've made a lot of progress, but we have much more to do. How are we working? On an institutional level, we're working in communities to develop and implement strategic security frameworks that enhance the safety and security of our people. 
They're based on best practice, but specific to the institutions. Simple process, assess, improve, deploy. The first thing that organizations need to do is establish a security committee, which can drive and guide the security strategy of an organization in a thoughtful, ongoing way. Undertake a threat assessment. Evaluate security plans. Do they exist? Are they tested? Once the assessment is complete, organizations need to make an improvement plan. They can include simple, low-cost items, like locking all doors except one, making sure emergency exits are clear. The Federation security director, eight weeks before the attack, cleared three emergency exits that were used the day of the attack. Add alarms to doors so we know when they're open and unlocked. SCN is working with organizations to ensure the decisions they make are best practice, and then we deploy. After adding a lock to a door, it's a good idea to keep the door actually locked, not propping it open. Take advantage of the Homeland Security funding that our community, particularly JFNA and our great partners at the Orthodox Union and so many of you, have worked to secure. <coughs> Finally, training. This is one of the least costly and most important things that we can do. Andy shared with me an email that he has in his inbox this morning. Several years ago, our campus security initiative provided, it provides training to Jewish students on a regular basis to empower them. One of those students emailed Andy, letting him know that he was at, the Gilroy, at Gilroy at the Garlic Festival. When that shooting happened, he remembered the training, the script he had, and he got out, and he led other people to safety. So this has real practical value. One of the things that we have to do is improve information sharing. I'm very proud we have a duty desk that is intaking threats and incidents and issues every single day from around the country. We work with the ADL on a daily basis on sharing intelligence and information. Today, you should have a flyer in front of you. We're launching a hotline within that duty desk, 844-SCN-DESK, to ensure a coordinated, comprehensive, and consistent approach to incident reporting that is operational in nature. So operational threats to our community, whether they're coming from Jewish students on campuses to report issues or incidents, or they're coming into synagogues. And we need to take this coordinated approach. Let me close by saying this. Not long ago, I visited the Tree of Life Synagogue, and I stood in the sanctuary with several others. I took a siddur to say the mourner's Kaddish. As I picked it up, I realized that the siddur had a bullet hole in it. Ed did the, as did the Aron Kodesh. Shortly after the shooting in Poway, Jonathan and I both walked into that institution. Almost immediately, my eyes went to the door leading into the sanctuary, which also had a bullet hole in it. To see bullet holes in our houses of worship in the United States in 2019, of all the things we do, from supporting overseas communities to our own social services, none of it will make a difference if Jews out of fear start to refuse to walk into our institutions. The very future of our community of being Jewish in the United States is at stake. This is a call to action, and we need to pick up the phone. So let's get to work. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. I'm grateful to be here. My name is Barak Shragai, and I'm the founder and CEO of Imagine Media. Imagine we are a technology and media company that specializes in producing content for Gen Z audiences, meaning anyone who is younger than a 25-year-old. We, are, we have a portfolio of uh, 15 content channels in different verticals like comedy, hip hop, music, uh, esports, entertainment that are now reaching more than 40 million followers on those platforms and generating 3 billion video views a month. We managed to create that scale within three years and most of our audience is actually here in the US. Now, when looking at Gen Z, you know, they just giving you numbers, this is 74 million people just in the US checking their phones 50 times an hour, watching content that probably most of you guys never heard of and will not even engage you. When Malcolm visit, visited our office and I showed him some of the stuff, he didn't ever, he didn't ever understand what he's watching. <laughs> like I started explaining him the science of slime and why slime becomes such a massive trend on social media and generating for us like more than half a billion views a month. So Gen Z, this is probably in my opinion, when I look at what can be the future of fighting anti-Semitism on social media is really looking at Gen Z. And this is the main way. So I'll, I'll share some tips on what can work when approaching Gen Z audiences. So first of all, and most important in my opinion, is social influencers. You know, there's 
two types of models, right? You have the top to bottom going to governments and doing those types of those types of programs, which are very important. But also bottom up is very important. Social influencers are today. 16 year old girl who is doing makeup tutorials on YouTube with 10 million subscribers. She has more engagement than the prime minister of, of Germany. And I'm not afraid to say that when it's coming to Gen Z audiences, she's influencing them. When she's landing in an airport, there are 15,000 people waiting for her waving like crazy screaming. So we represent more than 200 people like this that have an audience of more than half a billion followers on social media. And so this is one, social influencers, very important. Second thing is being relatable. I, when I see a fight, the fight against anti-Semitism on social media, a lot of statistics, a lot of things that are just, you know, boring and not relatable, instead of really sharing personal stories of people and bringing the people that are suffering from anti-Semitism to share their stories and really creating things that can go viral. The third thing is focusing on the right platforms. If you're not on Instagram, you're not on Snapchat, you're not on TikTok, yes, there is a platform called TikTok, <laughs> then you are not on the right places. These are the places Gen Z spend most of their time and we're talking about students and what's happening to Jewish, Jewish uh, students in campuses. Those students are watching YouTube all day. If you can influence those students through YouTube and through Instagram, that's it. You know, that it's better than even going to the campuses. Four is, um, and probably very important is inspiring them. Inspiration is a very important thing. 60% of Gen Z say that they want to positively influence the world through work. So probably recruiting young business owners, recruiting, um, not, not just Jewish, by the way, Jewish and not Jewish alike, to do programs at work could be a very important thing to do. So summarizing this, you know, I believe that Gen Z has the potential, especially because of their values, they're very opinionated, and now they're forming their opinions about um, any political stand, any social stand. They're now forming their sentiment and their view on social media. When, you're, when you see a 16 year old or whatever young guy in San Diego going and shooting or people becoming anti Semitic at this age, it's mostly because of the internet. This is what they're watching. So the internet should be the first front to uh, the first and main front to actually confront anti-Semitism. That's it. Last month at our annual KUFI Summit, I shared with a heavy heart that this was the first time in KUFI history that we had to dedicate an entire plenary session to anti-Semitism. While our mission at KUFI has always been to support the State of Israel and the Jewish people, we had been more focused on the state of Israel, because frankly, that's where the need was. But unfortunately, as we've heard already this morning and we'll continue to discuss, the emphasis has shifted for Kufi to the Jewish people. What does that look like in real terms beyond a plenary session? What it looks like to me, and I speak to you both as the co-executive director of Kufi, and I share that title with Diana Hagee, Pastor Hagee's wife, but I also speak to you as a Jewish mother of Gen Xers, which I always forget which generation they fall into, and, and I can concur that where my children are getting their information is YouTube. Where that generation lives, unfortunately, I'll admit it, you know, are on screens. And so I'm speaking to you as a Jewish mother, I'm speaking to you as the co-executive director of KUFI, and what can we do together to build bridges and build coalitions in this time, in this space that has never been more necessary? And this is where KUFI can be helpful to every single person in this room. We announced at Summit that we just passed over 7 million KUFI members. And what does that mean in real terms? It means that over the last few months that over a million KUFI members have signed our Shine the Light Pledge combating anti-Semitism. It means that of the 50 events that we do every month, and that's 5-0 in cities across the country, we're not only talking about the need to combat BDS, to uh, stand with Israel, more and more we're talking about how as a community, as a KUFI members, how we need to stand with the Jewish community in combating anti-Semitism. It means that we're on 330 college campuses. When we started KUFI 13 years ago, our initial inclination was not to start a KUFI on campus right away, because those of you in campus work understand the money and the time and resources it takes to build a serious campus infrastructure. 
but it was the Jewish students who came to their Christian students and said, we need support on campus. And we, as the leadership of Kufi, said, we can't allow Jewish students to be out there alone fighting for Israel. They need support. And now these Jewish students need our support, Kufi's support, in fighting anti-Semitism. So that is what we're doing on these 330 campuses. And it's what we're doing on a national level when we go to Congress and we're leading the fight on AAA on you know, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act to ensure the safety of Jewish students on campuses. So while I'm here this morning and while I'm here all day, we are here to really be your grassroots army. We want to work with you on the campaigns that you're working on. The Jewish community cannot combat the sin of anti-Semitism alone. And the leadership of Kufi, we are here to walk side by side with you. You know, a lot has changed since Pastor Hagee started the first night to honor Israel almost 40 years ago. 40 years ago when he went to, almost 40 years ago, when he went to the San Antonio Jewish Federation and he said, I want to do a night to honor Israel. Needless to say, there were some committee, committee meetings and some confusion and, uh, you know, and a little trepidation. And one man stood up, Rabbi Arya Scheinberg, and Rabbi, Rabbi Scheinberg said, we know how to deal with our enemies, but what if this man is a friend? And those seven words changed the history of the San Antonio community and of Christian Jewish relations. What if this man is a friend? So I'm here to tell you that the seven million Kufi members are friends. And the only way that I can process the rise in anti-Semitism while raising a 10-year-old and 11-year-old who now think that the new normal is having an armed guard outside their Jewish day school in Atlanta is to look in their eyes and say to them, not only is your mommy and your daddy keeping you safe, not only is the Jewish community keeping you safe, but so are the 7 million members of Kufi. So please reach out, please include us, and we are here, to be f we're, we are here for you. Thank you. To set the stage for our discussions, we've asked the panel of experts uh, to assess the danger of anti-Semitism at home and abroad and what is new about the current challenge. And I'm going to call upon Dan Mariashin, the Executive Vice President of B'nai B'rith International, uh, who will be the moderator and introduce his panel. Contemporary anti-Semitism has been described as the perfect storm coming from the left, the right, and from Islamists in the Middle East and beyond. Uh, in our own country, who would have thought that those attending Shabbat services would be the targets of shooters intoxicated with anti-Semitism, much of it from the Internet? Or that only a few short years ago, many viewed the BDS movement as confined to college campuses only to see the growth of that movement spread to the Women's March, to LBGTQ marches, and to such places as the United Nations Human Rights Council, and the Irish Senate. And who would have predicted that in the House of Representatives we'd hear charges of dual loyalty and Jewish money buying elections and political favors? Think about uh, this. Uh, the worst thing that you can say to an American Jew is that after 350 years on these shores and after many contributions that we have made to the building of this country and after the sacrifice of so many who serve to defend it, that we are not loyal to our country. Abroad, Arabic language media outlets and social media are a repository of anti-Semitic cartoons, articles, and opinion columns that portray Jews and Israelis as evil monsters. Cartoons incorporating grotesque Jewish images uh, that are uh, reminiscent of Nazi-era propaganda and Der Sturmer appear not only in the Arab and Muslim world, uh, but also in much of Europe. And many absorb anti-Jewish images and polemics, as well as the inflammatory one-sided anti-Israel narrative offered by both the print press and Arabic language satellite TV stations and websites. Iran has hosted Holocaust cartoon competitions, reflecting the Iranian regime's attempts to expand its promotion of anti-Semitism beyond the borders of that nation. For more than 35 years, the Iranian regime has been trying to delegitimize Israel through both soft and hard power. It spreads its message uh, through the media, uh, schools, television, and nonstop political rhetoric. The question is, uh, how do we deal and confront uh, with these challenges and these threats? Many of us have engaged in uh, educational programs 
uh, in my case, in our case, uh, in Europe, uh, in places like Romania and, and uh, in Spain. Each of the organizations represented here have done their work in terms of uh, education against anti-Semitism. But educational programs are not enough. Parallel efforts need to be undertaken in the spheres of law enforcement, the judicial system, and in the daily work of governments and organizations. How should we proceed then? Nearly 20 years into the struggle against contemporary anti-Semitism in this century, uh, a hot wash of sorts is in order, uh, and it needs to be done. Uh, with us today to provide guidance uh, and insight are three distinguished Jewish leaders who have devoted much of their professional careers to the fight against anti-Semitism. David Harris, CEO of the American Jewish Committee, Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, and Erwin Kotler, former Justice Minister of Canada, the chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, and a legendary advocate for human rights. So we'll begin our program alphabetically with Erwin Kotler. Th thank you, uh, Dana. As you described it, uh, we are witnessing, in fact, we've been witnessing since the beginning of the 21st century, a new escalating global, sophisticated, virulent, and even lethal uh, anti-Semitism, grounded in classical anti-Semitism, but distinguishable from it, which first found institutional and juridical expression in the Zionism as racism resolution, but has gone dramatically beyond that. A new anti-Semitism for which we need, in effect, metrics to help define it and combat it. But it can best be described using a one-liner as a discrimination against denial of assault upon the rights of Israel and the Jewish people to live as an equal member of the family of nations. In fact, of the right even to live. Simply put, traditional anti-Semitism is a discrimination against denial of assault upon the rights of Jews to live as equal members in any society they inhabit. The new anti-Semitism I mentioned is the discrimination against denial of assault upon the right of Israel and the Jewish people to live as an equal member of the family of nations and the emergence of Israel as the targeted collective Jew among the nations. Now, we've developed metrics with respect to identifying, monitoring, combating traditional anti-Semitism. The ADL identified 11 metrics, and in its uh, global study in 2014-15, it characterized traditional anti-Semitism as a persistent and pervasive virus. We have yet to do the same with regard to the new anti-Semitism, though the IRA definition references examples in that uh, regard. I'm pleased that Canada last month adopted the IRA definition. Indeed, Canada may be said to be uh, the architect of that definition. I know when I use the term uh, Canada, uh, WAGs are very often inclined to say, you know, Canada colon canceled for lack of interest. Uh, but I do want to give you a very quick snapshot of, of the Canadian experience, because I think it may be relevant uh, for what we are doing here. In 2007, Dan mentioned the Minister of Justice, I identified then 10 metrics of the new anti-Semitism, effectively ignored for lack of interest. In 2009, Canada and the UK uh, held a conference, London Conference to Combat Anti-Semitism, and adopted a London Declaration which foreshadowed the IRA definition. In 2010, we had the Interparliamentary Conference to Combat Anti-Semitism and adopted the Ottawa Parliamentary Protocol to Combat Anti-Semitism, which presaged uh, the Ottawa uh, precedes the IRA definition. In 2015, and this has gone almost utterly unacknowledged, let alone acted upon, the Canadian Parliament unanimously adopted a resolution which almost can serve as a template for the combating of anti-Semitism. It had three parts, very quickly. Number one, it condemned the alarming escalation in global anti-Semitism. That was four years ago. You know what has happened since you heard it this morning. Second, and this is particularly important, it called upon governments and parliaments in Canada to make the combating of anti-Semitism 
a domestic and international priority. Number three, it concluded by saying, and I'll excerpt from it, that criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic and saying so is wrong. But singling Israel out for selective opprobrium and indictment, denying Israel's right to exist, let alone calling for the destruction of Israel, is hateful, discriminatory, and anti-Semitic, and not saying so is dishonest. This is continued with a 2017 parliamentary condemnation of anti-Semitism, not unlike your recent uh, resolution uh, here in, in uh, Congress, and 2019 began with Prime Minister Trudeau invoking uh, the three Ds uh, with respect to condemning anti-Semitism. But I have to say, and with this I'll close, that there is a looming cloud to this uh, silver uh, lining, and the Canadian experience is not an helpful in, in this regard. Number one, Canada adopted the IRA definition last week and did so as part of a comprehensive anti-racism strategy. That anti-racism strategy spoke about the need to combat racism amongst African Canadians, amongst indigenous people, amongst Muslim Canadians, and of course with respect to Jews. The only criticism that emerged was not with respect to the other three groups, but to the adoption of the IRA definitions, examples with respect uh, to Jews. You've known the arguments here that this is silencing criticism of Israel, that this is suppressing free speech and the like, but the fact that it arose only with respect to the Jewish dimension of the anti-racism strategy tells you that the normative understanding and compatibility of the IRA definition has yet to be understood, let alone acted upon. Last week, and with this I close, uh, the Vancouver City Council was, called, was asked to adopt a resolution uh, anchored in the IRA definition. It did not do so. It referred it to a further a hearing saying that if it is to be adopted, and it is not yet clear that it will be, it must be done as part of a larger anti-racism strategy. So the uniqueness, the globality, etc., cetera, et cetera, all that we heard about anti-Semitism not yet been fully appreciated <coughs> and acted upon. I've got a 10-point action program in one-liners, but I'll leave it for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Erwin. Uh, Jonathan. So I'm Jonathan Greenblatt. I'm the CEO and National Director of the ADL. We're an organization that was founded in 1913 in the wake of the Leo Frank lynching in a climate of rising anti-Semitism and bigotry across the country. And I'm going to focus my remarks today specifically on domestic anti-Semitism. Um, and I'm up here with two esteemed people who will give you more of a global point of view. But I'm going to try to focus on what's happening here in the US. And I will say right up front that we are incredibly privileged and incredibly well served to have Elon Carr and Ken Marcus here with us today. And we should really just applaud. <laughs> to have public servants of this caliber from our community focused on not only serving our community, but protecting the national interest is really quite an extraordinary thing. And all of us are really grateful for your service. So, I'm going to talk about the trends, and I'm going to start with the data, and I'm going to start with the good news, because there is good news. So there was just a poll released by the Pew Research Center. This was last week, looking at the favorability ratings of different religious minorities in the United States. And the Jewish people scored the highest among all the religious minorities. North of Catholics, north of Protestants, north of Buddhists, north of everybody else were the Jewish people. And ADL, which has been monitoring anti-Semitic attitudes in the United States since the 60s, in our most recent survey, we're actually doing another one now, we found that anti-Semitic attitudes are at about 14% of the population, meaning about 14% of all Americans hold what we would consider classic anti-Semitic attitudes. That is less than half of what it was when we started doing this in the 60s. So that is good news. And indeed, we have achieved at the highest of levels in this country. The idea that there would be a summit at the Justice Department on anti-Semitism with three members of the cabinet and the director of the FBI, that there would be someone of Elon's role there as well, is extraordinary. And again, you can look at all walks of life and you can see where we've achieved. 
that is real, that is material, that is incredibly different than the America that our parents and our grandparents knew. Now here's the bad news. Anti-Semitic incidents in this country, as they are around the world, are unquestionably empirically on the rise. So I'm gonna share with you some numbers. So we saw after a, about a 15 year downward trend from 2001 to 2015, in 2016, anti-Semitic incidents increased 34%. So what are those incidents? Let me just be clear. The FBI and law enforcement agencies, they track crimes, felonies and misdemeanors, acts of violence, acts of vandalism. We track that as well as acts of harassment, intimidation, okay? When your child is bullied at school, when someone's called out on a subway platform, when a Hasidic Jew walking down the street in Brooklyn is verbally assaulted, we track that. So a 34% increase in 2016, and then followed by a 57% spike in 2017. The largest single year increase we've ever seen since do, for doing this for 40 years. And then last year, last year, the total number went down 5%. Good news. The bad news, it was still the third highest total in 40 years. Acts of harassment increased, and acts of violence more than doubled year on year. Of course, punctuated by, as we heard from a few of the speakers earlier today, the incident in Pittsburgh. Victims nearly tripled. So in your face, anti-Semitism is unquestionably up. We have 25 field office who collect and validate every one of the 1,879 incidents we saw last year in these United States. But if you don't believe us, you can look at the FBI. The FBI's latest data for 2017 reported a 37% increase in hate crimes against Jewish individuals and institutions. We are 60% of all faith-based faith -based hate crimes, the most targeted religious group in the country, despite our incredibly small numbers. Right, we are literally five and a half or so million people. So then the question becomes, why? Why are we seeing this increase in incidents against Jewish people in a time when the Jewish people ostensibly are so well regarded? I think there are a few things that are happening. Number one, we still live in the, we live in the receding, the backdrop of the receding nature of the Holocaust. New generations who don't even know, if you will, like what the, what the State Department does certainly don't know what the Holocaust was all about, which is why the ADL deeply believes in Holocaust education and is pushing for legislation on that. Number two, we're living in an environment of increasing socioeconomic uncertainty. And there's lots of things contributing to this. Questions about economic mobility, questions about labor markets, rapid demographic change, the advent of automation and AI, creates an environment and our paralyzed political institutions an environment in which people are incredibly, incredibly uncertain about the future, which makes them susceptible to kind of scapegoating and stereotyping, which drives anti-Semitism. Secondly, we are seeing the mainstreaming of extremism as a political force. And this is real. We have candidates with radical ideas from the fringe who now find themselves in the mainstream. And I'm gonna say this right up front. Don't comfort yourself by thinking this is an issue of the other side. This is a Republican issue, this is a Democrat issue. This is a left issue, this is a right issue. We literally limit ourselves and reduce our understanding when we try to limit this to some reductionist political frame. It doesn't fit that narrative. Because I will tell you, white nationalism is a global and domestic terror threat. It is responsible for the murders of Jews in Poway, in Pittsburgh, the murder of Heather Heyer in Charlottesville, the murder of Jews in Oak Park, the shooter in Gilroy, who Michael mentioned, was inspired by a white supremacist tract called Might is Right. Probably not on your bookshelf, Erwin, but mm -hmm. this stuff is out there. So white nationalism is a threat to all of us. And if you look back at the extremist-related murders, in 2018, 50 of them, 50 extremist-related murders, the overwhelming majority committed by white supremacists. Over the last 10 years, three quarters, three quarters of the extremist-related murders in the United States, white supremacists. 
And yet I would also tell you, the delegitimization of the Jewish state is also a domestic and global terror threat that indeed threatens us all. The stories that I have heard from college students, from activists, from elected officials about how the delegitimization of the Jewish state is being applied to the Jewish people, it is chilling. And don't think that this is an issue, because it absolutely is, regardless of your politics, regardless of how you feel about the current elected government in Israel. The Jewish state has become a proxy for the same things that have been used to demonize and denigrate the Jewish people for a thousand years. Thirdly, I'll say, and this was mentioned earlier, the weaponization of anti-Semitism by both sides. The weaponization of anti-Semitism by both sides is extremely troubling because it has facilitated the normalization of this. Phrases like cosmopolitans, neocons, globalists, Zionists, fed by conspiracy theories, are now part of our political parlance. If you don't think that this is a problem for you, for your children and your grandchildren, as Elon talked about, you are sadly mistaken. Because as the seeping of the culture, it may very well be, as Malcolm said, that we have always been the canaries in the coal mine. And again, we are on the front line today. But I will tell you this, there's a David Frum article in The Atlantic from about a week ago, which you all should read. And David's thesis is, what if it's not about us? but in an environment in which prejudice becomes a political tool, our history tells us we would be foolish to think it won't be turned on us. The last thing I'll just say is social media. Social media has become an ecosystem of intolerance. This is why ADL opened a center in Silicon Valley in 2017. We are working with all of the technology companies, Facebook and Google, YouTube, different brands like YouTube, Twitter, Reddit, Microsoft, Amazon, all of them. Because extremists of all types, political extremists, faith extremists, have exploited, have exploited these platforms and embedded intolerance in their DNA. And it's going to take a lot of work to fight that. It's a policy problem and it's a product problem. Final thoughts, there is no silver bullet to stop this problem. This is going to require a long game. This is going to require a degree of patience that we don't always have as a community. We want it now. But this is going to require a cultural commitment if we hope to create the change in the world. And ultimately, and I will credit the, the American Jewish Committee with, with this work, and many of you around the room, particularly you, I was so moved by your comments about what you're doing with Kufa, Shari. Because we need to make the case as Malcolm did earlier, just as racism is not just the problem of black people, it's our problem too. So anti-Semitism is just not the problem of the Jewish people, it's others' problems as well. And we need to stand with other groups at the grassroots where the seeds are being planted if we hope to reap you know, and grow a different garden in the future. Thank you. I want to thank uh, the Conference of Presidents um, for convening this extremely important and timely session. And I want to begin um, with a, um, a very abbreviated 19-year personal and analytical journey with respect to the issue before us today. In the year 2000, my family and I were on sabbatical living in Europe. And it was precisely on the ground in Europe that we began to see the resurgence or the rebirth of this new wave of anti-Semitism. We saw it personally. My children experienced it at their Swiss school. Uh, we saw it on the streets of London, where we stumbled upon an anti-Israel demonstration attended by hundreds of people where the speaker told the audience, I want to tell you a joke. What's the difference between a pizza and a Jew? And hesitated for a moment for dramatic effect before delivering the punchline. They both go in the oven, but at least the pizza does not scream. The audience roared with laughter in the center of London. I saw it in the year 2000 as I was reading 
newspapers from Italy to Spain to France as they invoked themes including the inversion of Israel and Nazism, wanting to, if you will, engage in a process of self-expiation as Europeans by imposing upon Israel Nazi themes. The Wehrmacht, the SS, the Gestapo, Israeli officials dressed in Nazi uniforms. We saw it with the, the church story, with the Palestinians inside the church, and suddenly baby Jesus becoming the baby Palestinian Jesus in the 21st century. The deicide charge being brought back, all of this having been just below the surface for 55 years in Western Europe, and re-emerging. And we began to talk to Jewish communities during that year, especially in France and Belgium. And we discovered growing fear among Jews. But the most important thing for this discussion, and the most important thing for the work of people like you, Elon, was the French government was resistant to understanding what was going on. And time permitting, I could walk you through the several meetings that we had with Jacques Chirac as president at the time. Mais il n'y a pas d'antisémitisme ici en France. No, there's no anti-Semitism in France. Je connais mon pays mieux de vous. I know my country better than you. Or the French Foreign Minister Vidrin telling us that what we thought was re-emerging anti-Semitism, what Creef and the Consistoire thought was re-emerging anti-Semitism was, quote, the importation of the Arab-Israeli conflict onto French soil, unquote. They averted their eyes. They didn't want to hear it. And on it went. We came back to the United States. We reported on what we had seen and the contacts we had had and the impressions that we had made. And that began a 19-year journey where we kept going back to European capitals, back to Jacques Chirac's office, back to the European Commission in Brussels, back to Berlin, back to Madrid, back to Rome. And here was the pattern. First, denial. Then secondly, grudging admission that there was a problem. But to Jonathan's point, it became then politicized because it only became a problem if it could be, if it could be categorized as your opponent's uh, issue. So for the left, there was a problem. It only came from the right. If it was neo-Nazi, they could be heard. But if it was in the form of delegitimization, Erwin, in the form of demonization of Israel, it didn't exist. And let's identify the elephant in the room when we speak especially about Europe. Because the fact of the matter is that in Europe, unlike Pittsburgh and Paulway and Charlottesville, every Jew killed as a Jew in recent years, every single one, from Borgas, Bulgaria, to Brussels, to Copenhagen, to Toulouse, to multiple times in Paris, every single one was killed by a jihadist. And that was one that the left in particular in Europe was completely and totally unwilling to touch. So we had made a baby step forward. Yes, there was a problem, but it was the other side. Then we had to move the discussion to depoliticizing the issue. And over time, with some success, but not total success, we were able to establish that there were really three sources of anti-Semitism. And if the discussion really were about anti-Semitism and not politics, then one had to be swivel-headed and be willing to address all three forms as they surfaced, where they surfaced, when they surfaced, however inconvenient it might be. And that's the process on which we're still uh, focused, the, the swivel-headedness of the analysis. Then finally, and I'm, I'm sh shortcutting this whole process, I'd like to write a new version of Churchill's Gathering Storm, which spoke about the years 1933 to 1940, because I feel in a sense that we've witnessed a new gathering storm in the last 19 years. Finally, it became, we have a problem. What should we do about it? And then there were the glib responses too often. Conferences, more conferences. How many conferences have you been to? How many conferences have you been to? 
How many conferences have I been to? That's the new default response. Oh, there's a problem? We're going to show you that our nation is in the lead. We're going to convene a conference. Yet another conference, yet another series of Schreigewalds, yet another series of pleas to governments. Because Jewish communities cannot address this problem alone, not in Europe, not anywhere else. When we visited Stockholm, we went to the Jewish day school about two years ago. And the head of the Jewish community told us, when we asked about security, he told us that the Swedish police had been assigned to protect the school and with guns. But then the policemen themselves who had been assigned complained that they were being put in harm's way. And they were withdrawn. And the Jewish community, as of a couple of years ago, was spending nearly one quarter of its entire budget, not on Holocaust survivors, not on meals for the poor, not on Jewish day camps, not on synagogues, on security because the government had defaulted. In addition to the conferences, the next glib response was education. Well, who's going to argue with education? But when you deconstruct the word education, what exactly do you get? Read the book. The English title is The Lost Territories of the Republic by Barbara Lefebvre of France. Read about what teachers like Barbara in French schools were writing about their efforts to teach the Shoah in the mandated curriculum of France. Read about their inability to do so because of the pushback by students. Students, again, that kind of vague, ambiguous word, really meaning largely migrant students, overwhelmingly from Muslim countries, who pushed back at the teachers and said, you want to talk about a Holocaust? Let us tell you about the Nakba. What Holocaust? The Holocaust that the Jews fictionalized to justify the existence of the State of Israel? And our colleagues don't have a response to what then? Yes to education. But how? How 75 years after the Shoah? How when the claims conference shows us that 40, 50, 60 percent of young people across Europe have no clue what the Holocaust is, cannot identify Auschwitz, and it's going to get worse, not better. And then, to top this off, they then turn to, well, we're looking at IRA, the working definition. Well, thank goodness they're looking at IRA, but IRA is not the be all and end all. It's a means to an end. It's not an end in and of itself. If IRA is adopted but not implemented, if people simply uh, applaud themselves on Twitter for having adopted IRA, but don't then operationalize it seriously in every nook and cranny of the country, to what end? And on top of this, as we look around Europe, look up situations like Wupperall in Germany the synagogue that was attacked by Palestinians and firebombed, and the courts of Germany that exonerated those that had been arrested because they found that their act was not anti-Semitic, it was anti-Israel. After all, they needed a target to vent their anger at Israel. There was nothing else nearby. They attacked the synagogue. It's hard to believe, especially we would hope in Germany. But the same Germany where your colleague, our friend Felix Klein, unfortunately announced publicly that the country can no longer necessarily protect every Jew who wears a kippah. I admire Felix Klein. It was a shameful statement. The proper response of him and the country should have been every Jew who wishes to wear a kippah should feel free, safe, and secure to do so. And we, the nation of Germany, will protect our citizens and their rights. And not, not resort to take it off, wear a baseball cap, or stay home. Look at the court case in Belgium, the cafe in St. Nicholas, where the Turkish owner of the cafe put out a sign in Turkish and in French, which said, no Jews welcome, dogs welcome. What did the prosecutors in Belgium do? They dropped the case. Look at the case of Sarah Halimi, the Holocaust survivor, very much 
the journey of my own mother, living in France on the eve of the war, escaping the Nazis over time, crossing the Pyrenees to Lisbon, but in her case, returning to Paris. Her granddaughters no longer believed in the French future. They made Aliyah. She was worried about their safety in Sava. She was murdered by her neighbor. But the courts have now ruled what? That the perpetrator was under the influence of marijuana and therefore was not responsible legally for the death he had inflicted upon her. Now, these are cases that will be appealed, but the very fact that we have to discuss them here, the very fact they have to be appealed with no certainty of the outcome, or take the rapper in Norway, the rapper in Norway who in a public concert said the effing Jews, his words, not mine, and the Norwegian legal authorities chose not to prosecute him. Those who know me and those who know AJC know that we're pretty mild-mannered normally. But our policy today needs to include a five-letter word, which is too frequently absent, anger. This is unacceptable. It is unacceptable that Jews cannot necessarily wear a kippah in Germany or in France, that a synagogue cannot be protected, that the Jews of Sweden have to protect their own schools because the state abdicates responsibility? Where is our collective anger? This is still within the lifespan of survivors, of eyewitnesses, of liberators, on the most blood-soaked soil in the world. Much of it, our blood. Where is the anger? And so it seems to me that we have to go to governments politely, yes, respectfully, yes, collegially, yes, but with an insistence, not being bought off anymore by references to the next conference and the next conference and generic references to education and generic references to a definition they may or may not ever accept, much less implement. We have to begin to show anger. And while we're at it, why not show some anger for the fact that Europe, which professes to fight anti-Semitism, and I don't doubt the sincerity of many, cannot even bring itself to fully recognize Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, despite the fact that it is a global anti-Semitic institution, and created this charade, what else can we call it, of two entities. Israel and Hezbollah don't agree on much in the world. On this one, they agree. It's one entity. And lastly, that these same European countries, which again profess to want to fight anti-Semitism on all fronts in all places, allows itself to be a tool at the United Nations, something Irwin knows particularly well, in singling out the sole Jewish majority and lone liberal democracy in the Middle East for separate treatment. Now, if you're a citizen of Europe and you observe anything at the Human Rights Council, or the Economic and Social Council, and you know little about geography in the world, but all you hear about is this one country that is being singled out as South Africa was singled out decades ago, what's your feeling going to be both to that country and those who identify with and support that country? All of this is connected, and all of this requires not just stepped up activity, but heightened anger. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.